whoever we are, whatever our identity is, uh, whether it's being in the military or being in other types of civilian life, our primary identity, the fundamental nature of who we are is to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus in whatever walk of life we may happen to be in. There's a member of our church who, who puts it this way. He's a, uh, he sells uh, high-end furniture and so works for Stickley. And then he, but he says to himself, I'm a disciple of Jesus masquerading as a furniture salesman. <laughs> And so he says the first thing about who he is, whether he, when he's going into the cell, is not just to be a salesman, it's to be that person who is a follower of Jesus in terms of the way he, he relates to people. We're going to start uh, in our initial section, you can see in your schedule there, with what we call the missional mandate. And what I'm really concerned about here in this opening section is uh, where do we set the bar in terms of what we are calling people to in terms of discipleship? Uh, what does that call look like? And in particular, have we made a false distinction between being a Christian and being a disciple. And uh, Tom was uh, alluding to our discipleship crisis in the church, uh, in, in ministry today, and uh, we'll look a little bit at some missional measurements there in terms of how we are doing, and what is a disciple anyhow? How would we look at that uh, in terms of the characteristics? And then in our second session, we'll look at the, the biblical model. I always say, when in doubt, read the instructions. <laughs> uh, if, in fact, we don't know exactly how to make disciples, well, let's go back to the biblical model because Jesus lays it out there for us as to how to go about making disciples. It's not a mystery. And uh, I teach a lot of pastors, and I'm surprised with the lack of personal investment of people in ministry in the lives of others, uh, even though Jesus has laid out that model uh, so clearly. So we'll review that uh, briefly just to kind of get that biblical picture back in focus so that we have that lens uh, through which we see that Jesus invested in a few and we need to replicate that particular model as well. And then the third area here is a tested method. Uh, that there is a way to go about making disciples that I frankly stumbled on that I think it probably is very consistent with uh, some of the military culture because we're going to be looking at small groups, groups of three, four, five, uh, as, as in place of investment, uh, in a sense, little platoons uh, where you're gathered together, being iron sharpening iron uh, in connection uh, with each other and seeing the life of Christ formed in people's lives. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you my punchline right at the beginning here and we'll return to it. Um, there is no quick way to make a disciple, as Tom has alluded to. It's a lifetime process. But uh, disciples are made, I think, in personal investment over time, relationally, because we need to go deep within ourselves, look at those things that need to be changed, invite Christ into that life, but do it in the context of relationships, the context of each other. And so we'll be uh, looking at that in, in, in some detail. Okay, um, so let's start with... Uh, a couple of quotes here, and the first one is that the crisis at the heart of the church today is a crisis of product. Bill Hall, one of the persons who writes in this whole area of discipleship, says, what are we producing? What are we growing people into? Have we lost our focus on disciple making? We have a crisis of what we are, are producing uh, in our life. And then, so with that in mind, Max Dupree, who's a Christian writer in the area of leadership, says that the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Where are we? Uh, in order for you to know where you need to go, you have to first of all decide where you are because you have to define the gap between where you are and where you want to get to, right? And my guess is in, in military planning, you do that very well. Okay, what's the reality? And then what's where you're going? Uh, I think of... Uh, I, you know, I'm a, a Starbucks fan, and maybe some of you are too. And if I go walk into a strange mall, uh, I'm going to probably want to find that Starbucks somewhere into that, in that mall. So what do you do? You go to that directory, and you walk up to the directory, and you see the map of the mall, and there's a little red dot, right? And the little red dot has an arrow pointing at it, and it says, you are here, <laughs> And then you find where that Starbucks is and you plot the path from where you are to where you want to go. So let's first of all just define where we are here in this whole process of, of discipleship and what's that gap between where we are and where we need to go. Um, it was in April of last year that uh, Newsweek magazine 
had a cover story, and the cover story was the decline and fall of the Christian America. And uh, the, a new survey had come out called the American Religious Identification Survey. It's the largest one that is done uh, to try to define where people are in America in terms of their religious commitments. And it's a massive, it's a massive study, uh, well over 100,000 people that are surveyed. And uh, they noted a number of things in this survey, that self-identified Christians had dropped from 1990 to present from 86 to 76 percent of the population. Uh, still, obviously, a very significant percentage of the population, but over a 20-year period, sociologically, that's a fairly huge drop. What they also noted was that those who stated no religious preference had increased from 8 to 15 percent uh, during that same period of time. Again, sociologically, a huge increase in terms of those who say, I, I don't believe in anything. Uh, those who identified themselves as either agnostic or atheist also had increased uh, significantly. And then one of the, the, the little facts that I found uh, somewhat interesting was that 27% of people did not expect to have a religious funeral. So no kind of desire to, to put their life into the context of some eternal understanding. Uh, now I don't raise this to simply say, um, let's refight the cultural wars, we've got to get our country back. Because I think it's more of a reflection on the church than it is on the culture. Uh, how are we doing in terms of our, of our discipleship? And so uh, let's, take a, let's take a look at that. Ron Sider has written a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. And I won't go into detail here on this. You can read this yourself. But the bottom line is essentially, as he uses George Barna's statistics to look at uh, the lifestyle of believers versus others in our culture is that there's not a whole lot of difference. We're not standing out in terms of the quality of, of our life, whether it's in the whole area of divorce. Uh, you can see the stats are that born-again Christians get divorced at the same rate that unbelievers do. In fact, in his study found that 90% uh, of the divorces among born-again believers happened after they became born again. Uh, so um, we're not doing well along those lines. Uh, sexual promiscuity among our youth, um, evangelical youth are doing a little bit better than, than the broader population. Uh, racism uh, found that the least prejudiced people in our country were Catholics and non-evangelicals. Uh, the more strong supposedly your belief came, Southern Baptist and evangelical, the more racist people seem to be. What's going on there? How can that be? Um, so you can see the other items here on this list uh, that say we've got a ways to go in terms of our understanding of what it means to, to have an impact. Uh, in the American Religious Identification Survey, they found that about 77 million Americans would be self-identified as born again or evangelical. Approximately what? A third of our population. And that's the, if that's the case, that salt and light that we've been talking about here already should be pretty impactful if, in fact, there's an understanding of discipleship among these 77 million people uh, who say that they are followers of Christ. And then you have the you know, similar stats that come from the Gallup poll from 2001 to 2007 that between 38 and 45 percent of the population self-identify as either evangelical uh, or born-again uh, believers. So I, I raise all this just to simply say, um, maybe in lawyerly language, can we stipulate <laughs> uh, that we've got an issue here? We've got a, a problem uh, to deal with. And uh, I love this George Orwell comment, um, George Orwell of 1984, Animal Farm fame, uh, who says, we have sunk, sunk to such a depth at which the restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent men. So let's start this morning by restating the obvious, and that is, let me ask us to turn in our Bibles uh, to Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. My guess is that uh, we are not strangers uh, to this particular text. We know this text as the Great Commission. Uh, after Jesus' death and then resurrection, he invites the 
disciples to meet with him as the resurrected Lord in Galilee. Uh, I love the honesty of Scripture where it says that uh, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, <laughs> even after the resurrection. Uh, I can imagine that some people felt like, I can't even believe what I am, I'm seeing here. So, we read in uh, verse 18. Then Jesus came and said to them all, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in this particular passage of Scripture, we note that uh, it starts with the authority of Jesus. I hope you can never read verse 18 without saying, what? Say that again? What did he just say? Jesus said what? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me? Wow. Wow. Now, you know what authority is, right? <laughs> and uh, Jesus says he's the supreme commander. He's the one who's head of it all. It's been given to him. All authority where? In heaven and on earth. That pretty much covers all the territory. I think it was Abraham Kuyper said that there is not one square inch of the universe over which Jesus does not say, that is mine. <laughs> I am Lord over that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's even more emphatic in the Greek structure, if any of you are interested to me in that. It's the order is given to me is all authority in heaven and on earth. He makes himself the center of attention there in case we uh, don't capture that. And so he says that he is the Lord over the universe. I love the way uh, Dale Bruner puts it. He says that Jesus is the cosmocrator. <laughs> he is the head over the cosmos, over all that th there is, and defines that. Brennan Manning, in one of his books, uh, I think captures this so well when he, when he writes, if I ask myself, what am I doing walking around the planet? Why do I exist? As a disciple of Jesus, I must answer for the sake of Jesus Christ. If the angels ask, it's the same answer. We exist for the sake of Jesus Christ. If the entire universe were suddenly to become articulate, from north to south and east to west, it would cry out in a chorus, we exist for the sake of Christ. The name of Jesus would issue from the seas and mountains and valleys. It would be tapped out by the pattering rain. It would be written in the skies by the lightning. The storms would roar the name Jesus Christ and the mountains would echo back. The sun on its westward march through the heavens, would chant a thunderous hymn. The whole universe is full of Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. Now, why does he say that? I think for a couple of reasons. One is he's saying, I'm the supreme commander. I have the right to tell you what to do. I can issue these orders. But probably even more true here in this context is that he's going to send us on a mission. And he's saying, the mission I'm sending you on, I'm accompanying you on that mission. I give you the authority to act in my name. You are never alone. With you and me together, you have uh, all the authority that you need. And he closes this passage of Scripture by saying, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm accompanying you. I, with this authority, uh, you go out and uh, are involved uh, by taking my name uh, where you go. And so he's going to give us what that, that commission is and how he's going to accompany us on that commission. So Jesus says our mission is to go. And uh, he lays it out kind of this way. There is one command in this passage of Scripture, one central order in a sense. And that's make disciples. There's only one command in the passage. And then there are three, what we would call, participles. Remember what that word is? 
A participle is what? A verbal adjective that tells you what, go- what making disciples is all about. We make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by, by teaching. And we'll look at uh, a little bit at those, uh, those words. But it describes also a process, I think, of reproducing. So we continue to reproduce this process. We go and we make disciples of all nations. We bring people to faith in Christ. We baptize them, bring them into the identity of what Christ is all about, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And part of that is to go back and go and reproduce uh, this whole process over and over again. So I think what we see here is a process of of teaching, of being formed uh, into into Christ-likeness. Now, um, this is really the the mission of every Christian organization, every church. Jesus has written the mission statement for us when he wrote this particular, and stated this particular command. Um, I remember to my shame and embarrassment when I was pastoring a church in Northern California uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, it was all the kind of craze to write mission statements. You go into Starbucks or other places and they have their mission statement on the wall of the, of the store. And so I think all the churches felt like, well, okay, we need to have our own mission statement. So I thought, well, let's work with the elders, come up with a mission statement that's unique to the church that I'm focused in on our history. And uh, we wrote, rewrote, the elders got together and sub-teams met. And we'd come back with various drafts of this mission statement. And uh, as I like to say, we deforested a lot of Northern California with the amount of paper that we had produced. And we felt like, oh, we're not there yet. Over a two-year period, this went on. And finally, I think probably out of sheer exhaustion, we agreed to a mission statement said, yeah, that's that's what we'll focus on. And here I am as a pastor, finally coming to this conclusion, oh, Jesus has done all the work for us already. (laughs) He wrote the mission statement right here. Uh, Go and make disciples. Uh, So you might have various versions of it uh, that an individual church would have, but Every church should have the same mission statement. You can come up with your own creative wording. Some churches have done that. You can see Willow Creek Community Church here um, is listed. Uh, Willow Creek uh, is probably one of the most well-known mission statements to turn irreligious people into fully devoted followers of Christ. That's the Great Commission. Go, see the transformation take place. Uh, CCOB is Christ Church of Oak Brook. This is the church that I serve, and this is our mission statement. Gathering in communities of disciples who worship, grow, and serve, going into all the world as witnesses of the life-changing love of Jesus Christ. So gathering in communities. We'll come back to this. Uh, this is our little shorthand for what a disciple is. Worship, grow, and serve are the three operative words, verbs that we use. And then going out beyond ourselves. Uh, There's a Wesleyan church in Buffalo, New York that says we exist to enable ordinary people to be transformed into extraordinary followers of Christ. Uh, I like that that statement. So, but all all the same thing. Well, we've got a dilemma here. Uh, A fellow by the name of Michael Wilkins, who is a friend of Tom and myself, academic uh, dean at Talbot Seminary, Uh, is also a person who writes and speaks in this field of discipleship. And he says, he goes out and uh, in the audiences that he's speaking to, uh, he asks them two questions. The first one is, uh, he asks people to raise their hand. I won't ask you to raise your hand here. But uh, he says, how many of you can say, in the humble confidence of your own heart, that you are a disciple of Jesus? Let's that question settle in. How many of you can say in the humble confidence of your own heart that you're a disciple of Jesus? Well, how do you think people usually respond to that? Well, raise your hand that they would say that. He would say, and, and people would sort of, a few timidly raise their hand and then put it back down again. Then he would ask a second question. How many of you can say in the confidence of your own heart that you are a true Christian rather than a true disciple? People would raise their hands very rapidly. Hesitant about being a true disciple. Confident about being a true Christian. So my question to you is, 
What's the difference there? What's going on? Is there a distinction, biblically, uh, between being a Christian and being a disciple? Are they not one and the same? Is that a distinction that we have made and uh, allowed ourselves to live with it? With? And I, what I would say is that we have made peace in the church with an unbiblical distinction, that you can be a Christian without being a disciple. Um, let me uh, go to one other slide here. I got this quote from uh, one of Dallas Willard's books, and uh, Dallas Willard talk, shares about a pastor who had a woman come up to him after worship one Sunday morning, and the woman said to him, you know, Pastor, I just want to be a Christian. I don't want to be a disciple. I like my life the way it is. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I will be with him when I die. Why do I have to be a disciple? Okay, you're the pastor listening to this woman. Uh, what would you say to her? What would your retort be to her that I don't want to be a disciple, I just want to be a Christian? And she obviously is making some distinction here that being a disciple is going to mess up her life you know, in terms of what she's going to have to do. So. Again, John Ortberg, who we're going to hear from in a few moments, uh, says that we are used to preaching the gospel as the minimum entrance requirements that you must accept to get into heaven. But it has little staying power to transform us into the kind of persons that really are followers, uh, followers of Jesus. So we can get this gift, we can receive it, and I think that's what people mean by being a true Christian. Oh, I have received Christ in my life. I've, I've made that transaction. I prayed that prayer, and uh, therefore... I'm okay, uh, but taking that next step, I'm not sure. I think this has a lot to do uh, with the way we have taught the doctrine of justification by faith alone uh, in our churches. Uh, we've been so allergic to works uh, that as an evidence of our faith that we barely mention the word works uh, as a sign of that which is an expression of who we are in Christ uh, because we don't want works to be the means of our earning our salvation. So we're justified by faith alone apart from works of righteousness. And then we forgot to say, oh, but by the way, uh, as a result of our being justified, we have a new heart, a new life, and we need to lean into uh, those works that we are called to. I came across an article in the Chicago Tribune uh, some time ago that arrested my attention. It was a, uh, one of those op-ed pieces in the Tribune. And uh, the title of the article was, What If He's a Christian Man? I thought, oh, this may be interesting. Now let me read this. And Robert McElvain was the author here, a professor at Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, he describes uh, two Christian men in this article, Richard Scrushy from Health South and Bernie Ebers from WorldCom, uh, have become infamous as uh, people who uh, certainly stepped way outside the bounds of, of ethics are now serving in prison uh, as a result of their taking their own com companies down and, and garnering resources uh, for themselves. Uh, Richard Scrusey, uh was initially uh, acquitted of his tr uh, trial with uh, Health South, and uh, he said, I give all glory to God for his acquittal. He's now serving in prison because of uh, some other things like bribery and things like that. Uh, and then uh, Bernie Ebers with WorldCom, uh, the largest corporate fraud case in history. And McIlvain became concerned about the disjunction between their profession of faith, both of them professing to be believing Christians, and their actions. And to quote McIlvain, I have long been familiar with the issue of whether an unchristian-like behavior is seen as having any bearing on a person's claim to be a good Christian. And at the time of Bernie Ebers' indictment, he went in front of his Southern Baptist Church in Clinton, Mississippi, and made the following statement. I want you to know that you are not going to church with a crook. More than anything else, I hope my witness for Jesus Christ has not been jeopardized. And the congregation gave this unrepentant Christian a standing ovation. The lack of connection there. And then McIlvain goes on to write in the article... I have been slow to comprehend the theological beliefs which such attitudes are based. Last fall, two of my students independently wrote in their journal that Christianity differs from Hinduism in that Hindus believe in karma, and so that one, what one does in this world determines uh, what happens to him, in the, to him or her after death. 
But Christians are, in the words of one of the students, not judged on their actions in life, but rather their belief in Jesus as the Son of the one living God. The other student wrote that the karma differs from Christianity and that Hindus believe in good works, whereas works are not very important in Christianity. Then he goes on to write, the brand of Christianity embraced by Bernie Ebers and Richard Scrooge and those who still see themselves as good Christian men is one basically that says you need to do is accept Jesus and then you can do whatever you want. The per this perversion of Christianity reduces Jesus to a get out of jail free card. Or not. <laughs> so, uh, what do we mean here then? Uh, what's the... I'm guessing what I'm getting at here, what's the root causes of some of our understanding of the lack of bringing together being a Christian and being a disciple, as was, was mentioned? There is no biblical distinction between the two. Um, there are, they are one and the same. So just to uh, give a couple of working definitions here of a disciple. It comes from a little bit more technical background that says that uh, being a disciple always implies the existence of a personal attachment which shapes the whole life of the one being described as mathetes, the Greek word for disciple, uh, which is, in particularity, leaves no doubt as to who's deploying the formative power. I love that definition. Leaves no doubt as who is deploying the formative power. Obviously, Jesus is deploying the formative power, all, the one who is all authority in heaven and on earth uh, for a, a disciple. Another definition of disciple uh, comes from my book, uh, Discipleship Essentials that uh, a disciple is one who responds in faith and obedience to the gracious call of Jesus. And being a disciple is a lifelong process of dying to self while allowing Jesus Christ to come alive in us. And then Michael Wilkins says, a disciple is one who has come to Jesus for eternal life, has claimed Jesus as Savior and Lord, has embarked upon the life of following Jesus. And then another term that we would use here is discipleship. Uh, that's not a biblical term. You don't find this word anywhere, but it's a biblical concept. And that's simply the process of growth into Christ-likeness and maturity and reproduction. So we enter into a process of discipleship. Once you become a disciple, as Tom again alluded to, that's a long process over a lifetime and will continue to unfold uh, what, who Jesus is in our life, becoming more and more infatuated in love with him as we begin to see those things that continue to need to be changed in our own life. As we put ourselves before his light, he examines us, and we see more deeply into the recesses of our own being that process of change as we conform our life to the image of Christ. And then discipling, uh, which is a lot of what we're trying to focus in on our time today, is an intentional relationship in which we walk alongside other disciples in order to encourage, equip, and challenge one another in love to grow towards maturity in Christ. This includes equipping the disciple to teach others as well. So, a relational process, we can engage together, we are walking alongside one another, and uh, in order to encourage, this is a place where we cheer each other on, equip their skills and practices that we need to learn, uh, challenge one another. Sometimes we need to be in each other's face and say, hey, did you follow through on that thing that you said you were going to do? It's taken a little long time here. But in love, uh, with that sense of, I have your best interest at heart to grow towards maturity in Christ. This includes equipping the disciple to teach others as well. So I always say within our discipleship groups, uh, you're always wearing two hats. You're there as a disciple yourself, you're learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus, but you're putting on another hat because you're going to be in the lead position as well. You're going to be investing in others. So it's not just about you. It's about learning to be able to uh, take other people on the journey uh, as well. I want to uh, insert here then something I've been alluding to, and that's uh, a, a couple of segments by uh, John Ortberg. John Ortberg is the pastor at Menlo Park Presbyterian Church in Northern California and uh, was on the staff at Willow Creek Community Church. I heard him deliver this message uh, at a conference in October of 19, or 2008 uh, at Willow Creek Community Church and uh, it's one of the finest uh, messages on discipleship I've ever heard. When somebody says something better than you can ever say it, it's time to let somebody else listen to it. And uh, so uh, I want you to hear a, this is probably about a 10-minute segment uh, where I think John 
really lays out this very issue that we've been working on uh, very well. Okay. Um, any of you seen the Olympics this summer? Michael Phelps is amazing, isn't he? Eight gold medals. Tell you how popular he is. A uh, guy who works with Facebook was telling me that Facebook reckoned they added five million users over the Olympics because Michael Phelps said that he goes on Facebook. Now, question, how many of you would say, um, be willing to say, I admire Michael Phelps? How many of you would be willing to say, I admire Michael Phelps? Me too. Here's the deal. Somewhere out there this summer, there was a kid watching Michael Phelps, and what happened to him went way beyond admiration. Somewhere out there, and there really was this kid, and no, none of us knows who it is yet. One day we will. But somewhere out there, there was a kid, when he watched Michael Phelps, his heart started pounding, and his mind started racing. And he said to himself, what Michael Phelps did, I could do. The way he swam, I could swim. Where he's standing on that podium one day, I could stand. And right now, while you and I sit here, that kid is going to the pool every day. He is reading articles. He is watching videos. He is looking for a coach. He actually wants to become like Michael Phelps. He actually wants to do what Michael Phelps has done. He is not just an admirer of Michael Phelps. He's a follower. Now, I will applaud what Michael Phelps did. But it's not going to change my life. I have not been in a pool since the Olympics. <laughs> I'm an admirer. I'm not a follower. There's a big difference. An admirer is impressed. A follower is devoted. An admirer applauds. A follower surrenders. An admirer approves, a follower obeys. A lot of people admired Martin Luther King. Some marched with him. Not many went to jail with him. Not many had their houses bombed as he did. A lot of people admired Mother Teresa. Not many followed her to live among the destitute and the dying. This is why we're here. It's why you have traveled to talk about what's been talked about these last two days. Um, when you come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew talks about two groups of people, and it's a dynamic that kind of runs throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus begins to teach, and we're told, when he saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach. Two groups. One is the crowd. And there's lots of them, and they're very impressed by Jesus. In fact, when it gets to the end of his message, we're told when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. The whole crowd admired Jesus. But while he was teaching, something happened in the hearts of a few of them. That went way beyond admiration. For a few people, for a few, while Jesus was talking, their hearts started pounding and their minds started racing. And something deep inside them said, This is it. This is what I have been longing for my whole life to be cleansed and forgiven of all my sin and mess, to know God, to have courage, to have a life beyond the constant worry and fear and anxiety, to not be a slave anymore to sexual desire or money or people's approval or success, to be a part of God's work in my own little way to redeem the world, to have confidence beyond death. I must have this. I would rather have what this man has and give up everything else in the world than have everything else in the world and give up this man. Therefore, I will pay any price. I will do whatever he wants me to do. I will go wherever he tells me to go. I will be whatever he says I should be. I am leaving the crowd. I am not just an admirer. From this day on, I will live my life as a fully devoted follower of this man. And they'd go home that night and they couldn't sleep. And they'd wake up the next morning and they'd be captivated by the same thing. 
the whole crowd admired Jesus, but every once in a while, somebody in the crowd wakes up and, and crosses the line and says, I will follow. Now, of course, Jesus knew this would happen. And one of the things that Jesus is constantly doing is challenging people to move from admirer to follower. And generally, that move involves some kind of action, some price to pay, something quite concrete. John 3, you all know this story. A Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. No one can do these miraculous things if you are not with him. John tells us he came by night, most likely because he did not want anybody to see him. And Jesus says, you must be born again. You must become my follower. You must publicly identify with me. And eventually Nicodemus does. When Jesus dies, Nicodemus publicly claims his body, places it in a tomb, becomes his follower. Sometimes people don't. Rich young ruler comes up, and uh, the text says, he fell on his knees before Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's an admirer. He falls to his knees. He calls him good. Jesus says, go sell everything, give the money away and follow me. And that's the deal breaker. The rich young ruler was ready to admire him. But following, where it would interfere with his life, his financial life or security or something, that's where he drew the line. There is in the New Testament a kind of a natural progression as people are coming to know Jesus. They begin as strangers to him. And then from strangers, they become admirers. And then from admirers, they may become followers. And of course, at each one of those points, people may decide that they're not going to go any further. Pilate does not become an admirer. Herod does not become an admirer. Rich young ruler does not become a follower. But I think what has happened in churches, especially in America in our day, is that we have added an additional category, and that category is users of Jesus. Okay, now we never put it that way. But in many, many, many people's mind, there is a kind of an alternative relationship with Jesus that kind of goes like this. I want to use Jesus to get into heaven when I die. And there's a deep problem with the gospel and the way that it has been presented because for many, many people, the gospel has become the proclamation of the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. Now again, we never put it that way. But it'll go something like this. How do you know you're going to go to heaven when you die? And of course, there's little, if any, discussion about what kind of community heaven might be and what kind of person might I need to be to actually enjoy being in heaven. It's just thought of in this cartoon way as kind of the pleasure factory and hell is kind of the torture chamber. And How do you know you're going to get into the pleasure factory because God's going to get people out? And the gospel is, you've been trying to earn your way in, so don't do that anymore. Get on the grace plan. Believe the right stuff about an arrangement that has been made for you, and then you have obeyed the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. And then you become a user of Jesus. Then, of course, there's no intrinsic connection then to being a disciple, to being a follower. Talking in this session about, is your church producing followers of Jesus, disciples, or just Christians, commonly understood? A Christian, as commonly understood, I think, is somebody who identifies with a religious subculture, so, you know, this is our team, and then the Buddhists are another team, and the Muslims are another team, and we like it when more people join our team. It's somebody who believes they're going to heaven when they die because they accepted an arrangement to get them in. But discipleship, making a serious intention to obey everything Jesus said, making a serious intention to do what Jesus said to do is treated as largely an option. Kind of extra credit. And churches are full of this kind of Christian. 
And then church leaders who spend a lot of time trying to re-motivate or re-excite them so that the church can be successful. And it gets tiring for everybody. It is interesting, I think, that the New Testament uses the word Christian only twice. And um, it actually originated as kind of a derisive nickname. It uses the word disciple 268 times. It's a lot easier to make a Christian, commonly understood. But the New Testament is a book about disciples. When he uh, put that word in red, users of Jesus, up there, that to me said a lot in terms of where we have come in countering the whole issue of, of discipleship. Um, I think I'm going to skip uh, this particular thing. But uh, So what we're trying to do here is sort of diagnose the problem. Try to bring together this whole issue of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple, see them as one, as the New Testament sees them, and let that bar that we're calling people to be the, the standard. Let me just finish off uh, this particular session by looking at how Jesus himself defines what a disciple is. Go back to our text here, here this morning. Uh, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and then teaching. And so Jesus gives us the three elements here of what a disciple is. Um, so he starts with saying, first of all, a disciple is one who goes, uh, one who moves out. So this is the evangelistic task of the church. I say it scares to death most people in our pews. So, uh, in the last uh, month of, in September, we had a, an evangelistic crusade in our area um, put on by, uh, my, my brain is, the, the Harvest Crusade. And uh, we, citywide, I've forgotten exactly the name of the evangelist right off the top of my head here. But we, we were a part of that. We're in, engaged in it in, in our church and uh, calling people to, to take people there. And I did two sermons at the end of September on the whole issue of our anxiety around evangelism. Uh, they, you know, ask me to do anything else but to talk with other people about who Jesus is in my life in order that, for them to be able to come to know and understand that, that that's a, a very anxious thing for us, us to do. And we have a hard time uh, getting to the point of doing that. And I think in part, uh, it's probably because we have uh, a certain image of what uh, an evangelist is, what it means to do evangelism. Uh, one of my favorite books on this subject is written by a woman by the name of Becky Pippert, and uh, she has uh, it called Out of the Soul Shaker and Into the World, and in the early part of the book she talks about uh, what she thought an evangelist was, what's somebody who is that articulates the, the faith. She said she came to faith in Christ as a college student, and uh, for whatever reason she uh, thought sharing my faith with others was offending people for Jesus' sake. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm supposed to do as I, as I share my faith. And so the impression she got was that witnessing was trapping some unsuspecting victim and then forcing them to listen to your spiel about Jesus. And uh, she wrote in her book, she said, the result was that I put off witnessing as long as possible. Whenever the guilt became too great to bear, I overpowered the nearest non-Christian with a non-stop running monologue and then dashed away thinking, well, whew, it's uh, the uh, fall of 2010 and hopefully the guilt won't build up again until the winter of 2011. You know? And, uh, and I, I say the unsuspecting victim was hoping the same thing, uh, that, uh, that you were just a mark, you were a target, um, which, which to share. And I built my uh, reflections in September around uh, a text in John chapter 1 uh, where I think we can derive some principles of sharing our faith that reduce our anxiety. I called this an anxiety-reducing sermons uh, around uh, sharing our faith with others. But one of those, I think, principles has to do with being able to be good listeners, uh, to be able to, to uh, focus in on uh, the right to be heard and listening to people uh, as we then build a bridge between our heart and their heart and, and share the good news with, with them. In this particular passage in John chapter 1, uh, it's a story about uh, John the Baptist and his disciples and Jesus coming on the scene. And you might recall that 
Jesus, John the Baptist announces Jesus as the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. And then when he does that, two of his disciples leave him and follow after Jesus. And in part of this whole dialogue, uh, Jesus notes Andrew and the other disciple coming after him, turns around and says to them, what do you want? I like the uh, NRSV translation a little better, and that is, what are you looking for, Jesus asks. Uh, he raises questions. He listens to their heart. He gets inside of them and asks these questions that uh, uh, allows them to, to articulate what it is that they are, are looking for. And I like to say that probably one of the best evangelistic tools we have are these two ears on the side of our head. Um, the reason why somebody has said that we have two ears and one mouth, note the ratio and respond accordingly. <laughs> you know, hear, listen, get into, come alongside. Hear what's going on inside of someone. Ask the appropriate questions that draws forth. What are you looking for in life? Um, a response uh, from, from people. I came across a, a poem that I think uh, captures this very well. Uh, it's entitled, Cold Water Hot Coffee. Sometimes uh, that cup of cold water turns out to be a cup of hot coffee, and what we're asked to do is to pour it and to listen. Sometimes we Christians in our enthusiasm think that we are asked to save the world, when what we're asked to do is go into it and tell God's story to people in need of some good news. Anxious activists forget that just listening is an act of compassion. Driven disciples forget that just listening is an act of faithfulness. Guilty givers forget that just listening is an act of stewardship. And since we church people have a tendency to be driven and anxious and guilt-ridden, perhaps we should read the directions again, pour a cup of hot coffee, and listen in his name. Create these listening posts. Create these places where we can, can hear. One of the uh, most powerful uh, evangelistic opportunities uh, I had and I would not consider myself an evangelist. I consider myself more of a teacher than an evangelist. But uh, when we were living in Southern California, we lived on a, on a block that was pretty cohesive uh, near the seminary in Pasadena. And we knew our neighbors pretty well. Uh, we got to know them through block parties and uh, neighborhood watch opportunities, that kind of thing. And so one of the neighbors, who was a fellow Christian, and I got the thought that we should have a, an outreach-oriented Bible study uh, in, on our block. While we're here, we need to really reach out and provide an opportunity for people to hear the good news. And so we had selected some, a very simple study on the Gospel of Luke, focusing in on the person of Jesus and wanting to invite our neighbors. This happened to be the summer of 2001 uh, when this was going on, and we were developing this and just getting ready to launch it in the fall of that year. Well, you might recall what happened <laughs> in September of 2001. And uh, all of us being in a state of shock as to what was taking place. And if you get back to those emotions, which probably is not too hard to get back to, uh, the sense of disorientation and wondering what was happening to our world, uh, what was taking place here, and uh, people having the pins knocked out from under them uh, emotionally. Well, on, that happened on a Tuesday. Uh, President Bush declared a day of prayer and remembrance for Friday of that week, you might recall. And churches held services, communities gathered uh, to, uh, to pray together, to come together as, as communities. My wife and I had an idea. We said, gee, why don't we invite our neighbors to come over to our house? We'll bet that there's a lot of people who don't have a place to go. And so I wrote up a letter inviting people to come on Friday evening, 7 o'clock at our house, and we will gather together, we'll process our feelings from the week, we'll spend some time praying together and supporting each other as, as a neighborhood. Wrote that up, dropped it in about 30 mailboxes, uh, you know, early in the or midweek, having no idea how, of how many people would show up to this opportunity. We thought, well, maybe if seven or eight of our neighbors come, that would be uh, wonderful, but we can have a little group that would gather together. Well, 24 adults showed up at our house that night with about 10 children. We kept setting up chairs because we weren't anticipating uh, that many. So we ended up with a ring of 12 chairs in, inside a circle and 12, 12 chairs outside the circle. And we went around and we began sharing, where are you? What are you feeling? 
What were your, what are your emotions at this particular moment? And um, one of the women who came that night with her two-year-old daughter uh, had been in Boston earlier in the week. She had been scheduled to be on one of those planes that went into the Twin Towers on Tuesday morning and moved her flight to Monday night and uh, came home on Monday evening. She would have been on one of those planes. Her husband was still uh, in Boston because planes were not taking off uh, by that time. So you can imagine the emotion in the room uh, as we shared, and we spent some time then uh, praying in whatever way we knew how to do that because I didn't know exactly where people were uh, in, that, in that group. At the end of that time, I just invited people, anyone who would want to be a part of a regular ongoing study to discover and look at the life of Jesus Christ um, to come. And I admit that only a small subset of those people decided to make that commitment, but we had a number of our neighbors who would come on our house on Tuesday evening. And one of those neighbors was uh, a young woman with three young kids who lived right across the street from us. Her name was Elena. And I said to Elena, why did you come? What are you, what are you looking for? <laughs> and she said, I'm looking for answers. Um, I have a sister that committed suicide. I, I just need to uh, understand this spiritual realm, what's going on. I need answers uh, to these kinds of things in my life. And we simply, I think, provided a listening post for her to the, bring her questions, to discover the life of Jesus, to see what it meant to have Christ in her life. And when we can create these kind of listening posts, we're being evangelists. We're being ones who connect people uh, to the life of Jesus. So a, a disciple is one who has a passion to get that good news out uh, to others and uh, to do it in whatever way you are designed to do. Uh, I understand that from a little exposure to Chris Braddy that Chris has no trouble going up to people and introducing himself and being with strangers, right? Any of us know Chris? Uh, well, we're probably not all Chris Braddies, are we? We have our own ways of doing things through our own personalities. And uh, that may be a very natural thing for him, but there are other ways that are natural for us in terms of our, our connecting with, with other people. So a disciple is one uh, who goes and uh, listens carefully so that we can walk across that bridge of building a connection between our hearts to other people's hearts and sharing the good news. And then uh, baptism. Baptizing into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. A disciple is one who has been baptized. I oftentimes wonder, well, this is very interesting. At the core of discipleship, we have baptism. So let me ask you the question. Why do you think that is so central here uh, to what it means to be a disciple? What is signified by baptism? And so what we've been discovering today, rediscovering, I think, is the doctrine or the concept of the Trinity as that first community, that first fellowship. What does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? Uh, well, we read that God said, let us make humankind, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What does that mean? Well, let's make human beings relational just as we are relational. So we're made for relationship, relationship with God and relationship uh, with each other. And we're being called into that community. Uh, there was an old mystic by the name of Meister Eckhart who said that uh, God created out of the laughter of the Trinity. I love that. That fullness of joy of the Trinity. And so he made us for a relationship with himself and calls us into that community, a new community of believers, with him, his life, as the center of that. I like to tell the story of uh, my wife and I during the first number of years of our marriage. We have been married 41 years and uh, it's a great life, a uh, great time in our life. But in the first five years of our life, we were, I think, a typical sort of 60s couple. Uh, in the 60s, it wasn't the, all the great thing to have children. You know, you wanted to be free. It was the era of freedom. And if you have children, that's going to tie you down. And so I think we entered our married life with that 
kind of mentality that said, eh, we're not sure whether we want to have kids or not. And we'd always kind of rebuff the inquiries five years into our married life. When, the, when are the children going to come? Well, you know, um, we, we want to live altruistically. Why to bring another uh, f- mouth to feed into the world? Uh, this world with the specter of nuclear holocaust, why would you want to bring a child into that kind of world? Had all these kind of high-sounding kind of reasons as to why we didn't have children. But unbeknownst to each other, we began to change our attitudes about that. But as oftentimes happens, when you change your attitude and say, yes, maybe I want to have a child, you're kind of afraid to admit that to your spouse because you assume that they are at a different place. Well, um, that changed because we suspected my wife was pregnant. And uh, then we began to say to each other, oh, well, this might be a welcome thing. And then she went off to the doctor and to get checked out, as you did in those days. I don't think there were any of those kits that you could use to decide whether you were pregnant or not. And uh, the report came back, no, the tests are negative. You're not pregnant. And we both kind of caught our breath and we said to each other, oh, how disappointing. <laughs> Uh, We had changed our mind. We had actually already started to kind of fall in love with this child of promise when we started to think about the fact that we could have maybe a product of our together love on which to bestow love. And we were disappointed. Well, fortunately, the doctor was wrong. (laughs) We do have a 35-year-old daughter to show for it uh, today. But what that said to me was, There's this longing, even in a married couple, to to have something outside of themselves to bestow love upon. And and that became a sort of an analogy for me of the the Trinity. Out of the love of the Trinity, he brought us into being so we could be welcomed into that circle of the Trinity and become a part of that community. And so discipleship is really a discipleship of community. We become a part of a group of people, a network of people, the the thing called the church. There is no discipleship apart from relationships with other believers investing in their lives. There's no such thing as solo discipleship. You don't just go off and be a believer by yourself. uh, Because Christ is creating a new community in which he has then transformed people uh, into another life. And then finally here we are to teach, to to observe the teaching of Jesus. We're being taught to observe or obey all that he has commanded. I sarcastically say sometimes we uh, teach them to study everything that Jesus commanded. Teach them by holding classes, um, fill our heads with doctrine, uh, but it's not really about obedience. It's about more information. And what Jesus is about is transforming of our lives to be like him. I'm going to give you another clip here. I want to conclude uh, with this and a couple of other closing comments uh, with this particular section because I think, again, John Ortberg lays out very clearly this whole idea of what it means to obey. Uh, When we talk about faith, one of the things that has troubled me a lot is how can two people affirm the same beliefs, you know, recite the Apostles' Creed or whatever together, believe the same stuff, and yet one of them is loving and courageous and truthful and generous and winsome, and the other one, and everybody kind of knows, is unloving, severe, judgmental, kind of greedy, arrogant, and yet they would both say that they believe the same things. How does that happen? Well, to get into that, I want to talk about three different forms of faith or three different kinds of conviction. This is part of what I get into in Faith and Doubt. And it's a little tricky to teach out. So if I lose you at all in this talk, I will lose you in the next five minutes. So everybody stay with me for the next five minutes, okay? Everybody stay with me for the next five minutes, okay? Okay. Three different kinds of convictions or um, flavors of faith, things that people believe. The first one 
uh, involves what might be called public convictions. These are things that I say because I want to get you to think I believe them, whether or not I actually really believe them. Kind of PR statements. So somebody really close to me asks, does this dress make my hips look too big? And the correct response is, no, I had no idea that you even had hips until you raised it right now. Okay? Public convictions. We associate this kind of stuff often with um, politicians. Biblical example would be Herod. When the Magi come and they tell him that they're going to go find the, the Messiah who's now been born. And he says, when you find him, come tell me so that I can go worship him with you. Now, did Herod really want to go worship that baby? No. That's a public conviction. Okay? Then the second kind, and this is where things get quite interesting. There are what might be called private convictions. These are things that I actually think I do believe. I'm actually pretty sincere internally about these beliefs. However, it turns out when circumstances change, when my situation is different, it may turn out I didn't actually believe this conviction at all. It was not really firm. For example, let's say that there is somebody who believes that they are deeply attracted to another person as long as that other person is not available, as long as that other person is committed to somebody else. And this person believes they really want to be with that person, as long as they're available. And then one day when that other person becomes available, when that other person is now um, open to a relationship, in fact, eager to a, for a relationship, this person discovers that they are not really interested in that other person at all. They got commitment issues. And in our society, there really are such people, and we call them men. Okay? So, as a private conviction, I think I believe it. Um, biblical example of this one would be Peter, when Jesus is going to go to the cross, and he calls his disciples to him, and he says, you're all going to run away from me. And Peter says, no, Lord, I would never do that. Even if everybody else deserves you, I will stand with you to the death. Now, when Peter said that, in that moment, was Peter sincere? Yes, he was sincere. Was that conviction authentically true? No, it was not. It did not stick. When his circumstances changed, he found out reality. Okay? So, there are public convictions, things that I say I believe, private convictions, things I think I believe. Turns out, I may not even be the best judge of what I actually believe, because the third form of convictions are what might be called core convictions. And these are the things that I demonstrate that I believe by what it is that I actually do. Because the idea here is, everybody has a kind of mental map about the way that things really are. We have ideas about the way that reality really works. And you live at the mercy of those ideas, whether you want to or not. And I don't have to drum up a sense of uh, fervor about them. I just believe in the law of gravity. So I don't have to say, today I'm going to work really hard not to jump off a high building or a ledge or something like that. Because I just believe that that's true. And so I won't step off that unless I want to hurt myself. Your behavior is always a function of your purposes and your core convictions about how things are. And you cannot violate those. Public convictions, these are things I say I believe. I have private convictions. These are things I think I believe. But then I have core convictions. And these are things that I show that I actually believe by what it is I really do. My public convictions may be bogus. My private convictions may be fickle. But I never violate my core convictions about the way things really are. Now Jesus comes along, like any great teacher, what is he interested in changing in people? Public convictions, private convictions, or core convictions? core convictions, because we live out of this, see. We don't even have to try to live out of this. We just always live in a way that reflects this. And in Jesus, for the first time, the human race sees somebody whose public convictions, what he says, private convictions, what he feels, and core convictions, what he actually believes and shows by how he lives, are absolutely congruent with each other. Now, we come to church, and this is where it gets a little scary. Um, the two people that I was talking about before, 
One of them is loving, gracious, generous, courageous, truthful. And so the other one is like diametrically opposed. They both publicly affirm the same convictions. They both privately think they believe the same stuff. They would both say, yes, I affirm the Bible is the word of God, that Jesus is the son of God. I believe in the resurrection. They both believe they believe this stuff, but their mental maps about how things really are are fundamentally opposed to each other. And of course, the great danger is that the guy whose mentally map is utterly opposed to Jesus doesn't even know it because he's convinced, I believe. There was a um, uh, church in Minnesota. This one actually did happen. And, and um, uh, they're one of the churches that recites the Apostles' Creed each week when they gather for worship. Um, they also, they were just switching over to computers when computers were first coming into use. And they found out when they did liturgies for services, like funerals, if one person died, they could have the service. And then when somebody else died, they could just plug in the name of the newly deceased and print out the bulletin. And it all worked fine. There was a woman uh, named Mary who died, and her service went fine. And then another woman named Edna died. So they told the computer, just replace the word Mary with the word Edna. And it worked great all through the service till they were reciting the Apostles' Creed. And everybody said, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Edna. I don't know, that's what it says, it must be right. Uh, we just kind of go on autopilot on the stuff we believe. And what I was thinking is it'd be really interesting when people gather together if instead of reciting the creed that we're supposed to recite, that we're supposed to believe, we had people actually recite the stuff they really do believe at the core level. Would that not be an interesting confession of faith? I believe a lie is an abomination under the Lord and a very present help in time of trouble. <laughs> now, what Jesus is into is changing people at this level here. And by the way, uh, somebody was mentioning earlier today uh, this little verse in James, James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such a faith save them? And uh, this is one of those deals where there have been times where people have disagreed theologically and, and sometimes thought James disagreed with Paul. Or I don't think there was any difference between James or Paul or Jesus on what faith is. The point that James makes here is not that in addition to your faith you have to add certain good deeds or God is not going to let you into heaven when you die. That is not what he is saving. Saying, being saved, saving faith is not the minimal amount of stuff people have to believe for God to let them into heaven when they die. Saving faith is that faith which enables me to live in the reality of the kingdom of God that is available to me right here, right now through Jesus. That's what saving faith is. And it is a faith that cannot help transform because it becomes a part of my mental map about the way things are. See, the way that it worked with the disciples, this is how they were spiritually formed. They looked at Jesus and they said to themselves, He's got it. He's it. He knows. He understands. And then they began to do what He said to do. They began to be in their relational life, in their humility with each other, in their finances. They actually began to do stuff and they discovered that He was right. And they began to see reality the way that Jesus saw reality. Initially, they had faith in Jesus. They thought, He knows. And then over time, they began to have the faith of Jesus. And the way things looked to Jesus is the way things began to look to them. Jesus would say things like, it is better to give than to receive. Now, do I, do I believe that? Well, I, I affirm it publicly. I think I believe it. But, of course, I have to look at what I'm actually doing to find out what it is that I really believe. The way that formation works is the disciples were with Jesus and they began to discover that he's right about stuff and they just trusted him with their life each day until eventually they decided that, of course, he's trustworthy with their eternal destiny, too. Here's what happens in our day. We tell people 
more or less, that it is possible to trust Jesus with your eternal destiny without trusting him with anything else. And it's not that God won't allow it, it just, <laughs> it just doesn't work. It, it may work publicly, it may even work privately. People may think they're doing it. But see, in the Bible, when Jesus says, trust me, so interesting. When I was growing up, if we asked somebody, do you trust Christ? Have you trusted Christ? That was code for, do you believe in an arrangement that will let you into heaven when you die? And in the New Testament, trusting Jesus never meant, do you believe in an arrangement that will get you into heaven when you die? In the New Testament, to trust Jesus just means to think he's right. Right about what? Right about everything he says. And then I'll do it. And that's a follower. Is your church producing followers or just Christians as commonly understood? So that brings it home, doesn't it? Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. What are we trying to get down to here? Those mental maps, the core, that automatic response. I like the way uh, Dallas Willard talks about it. He talks about three levels of the will. He talks about the impulsive will, the uh, reflective will, and the embedded will. In our culture, we're sort of taught the impulsive will. Just kind of do what you want to do. Uh, go with your emotions, go with your desires, let the impulses and stimulus of the culture carry you along. Uh, well, obviously, as believers, we don't uh, believe that. But then he's, there's that next level, and that's the reflective will. That is, we actually reflect on our behavior, our attitudes, our emotions, our responses uh, to various things. I, I practice a prayer on a regular basis called the prayer of examine where I start my day by looking back to the previous day and take notes about, and I say, Lord, take me back through yesterday with the people that I've met, with the thoughts that I had, with the uh, ways that I responded to people in situations. And what do you want me to notice about yesterday? What do I need to pay attention to? Uh, what do I want to give thanks to because of the connection you made? What, what missed opportunities do you want to show me? That's the reflective will, reflecting on and bringing it into alignment on a day-to-day -day basis uh, my own life before Christ. And then the, the next level, and this is where I think where Jesus is talking about here, and that's the embedded will, that we become so responsive to what God is doing in our life that in the moment... We have that will so embedded in us that it's become a part of our automatic epidural response system. We don't even have to think about it. So somebody may make a, an insulting comment to you. And your response is, what? To love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you because that's so embedded into our being that it's a part of who we are. I think that's what, uh, what Jesus is getting at here um, in, this, in this section. Well, I've gone over my time uh, in this first section. So we wanted to, to look at a couple of things in this first section. What, what's, what is a disciple? And the, this false distinction we've made between being a Christian and being a disciple and uh, how we have to close the gap between those two and not live with that distinction in the context of our fellowships and our churches and our our ministries, but bring those two together because there is only one call, and that's the call to be a follower of Jesus in all that we are and do. And then he spells that out, Jesus does for us, uh, by giving us three words, that a disciple is one who goes, the disciple is one who is baptized into the identity of God, their identity is subsumed into who he is, and that we are on this lifelong journey of being taught to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. So that's, that's the bar that we are setting uh, as we talk about uh, discipleship. In our next session, I guess we'll take about a 15-minute break here. Uh, we'll look at uh, a brief overview of how did Jesus go about making disciples. And then uh, finally in our after-lunch session, I think we're doing lunch from 11 to 12, uh, we'll take a look at how, how do we actually operationalize all of this in terms of our relationships.